they haven't been asked to pick one side or the other. I know both of these actually prefer the side of the argument, and it represents their practice. That's a very um, nice part about this debate, that it's not falsely constructed. Um, I think also one other part about this is the clinical question is something that we as a community are quite divided on. Um, as a show of hands, uh, how many of you, and I, I presume many of you probably do both traditional epidural or straight epidural, and many of you do combined spinal epidural in certain circumstances, but almost certainly one aspect of that practice dominates in your uh, work, in your own practice, I should say. A show of hands, how many would identify themselves as primarily performing traditional epidurals in labor analgesia? Looks, I would say, two-thirds of the room. How many of those of you are primarily combined spinal epidural anesthesia as your primary? I would say two-thirds, one-third, maybe even three-quarter to one-quarter. Okay, so that's our starting point. I'm not going to re- um, uh, poll at the end of this. We're going to do 20 minutes for each uh, speaker and then have a short question and answer session to follow. Dr. Scavone. Thank you. Okay, forevermore. Um, if I had to describe the ideal labor analgesic Jesus technique, it would include these qualities. You'd have a fast onset of high quality analgesia with minimal motor blockade. You'd have to rely on your catheter in case you had to go for cesarean delivery. And you wouldn't want to have any ill effects on the progress of labor, the mother, or the uh, fetus or neonate. So let's see how these uh, measure up. Okay, regarding onset and quality of analgesia, I think you're going to have to agree that the edge goes to CSE. This was one of the first articles published by Dr. D'Angelo and his group. It was a randomized controlled trial where they randomized patients to receive either CSE or epidural. You can see what the drugs were there. These are the pain scores over time. Um, in the squares, the CSE patients had a much faster onset of their analgesia. The differences persisted for up to 30 minutes, OK? So faster onset with less bupivacaine and less motor block. Here's another study published by Collis and colleagues. Again, a randomized controlled trial. You can see what drugs were used in this study. Again, there were differences in pain scores. The, circle, the open circles are the CSE patient group um, patients. They had a much faster onset of their analgesia. Again, the differences persisted for up to 30 minutes, so they had faster onset. Again, less bupivacaine consumption, less motor blockade, and they measured patient satisfaction, too, and patients were more satisfied. Here's one more I'm going to show you. They compared, um, as you can see, the recipe for CSE. The other two uh, used higher concentrations. This group used 8% bupivacaine still demonstrated a faster onset of analgesia. And now we get to the quality of analgesia um, question. So a lower nadir pain score. The patients in the CSE group were more likely to have pain scores of 0 or 1 initially. Again, this was all done with less bupivacaine and less motor blockade. Um, it's not until you compare epidural solutions of 16th percent to CSE that you end up evening the bupivacaine and motor block between the two groups. So when you can do this comparison, there's still a faster onset of analgesia. But finally, for the first time, you see there's no difference in motor block. But you can imagine if you're dosing your patients who are in very advanced labor with 16th percent bupivacaine into the epidural space, you're probably going to exaggerate the differences in analgesia. So my first point is that if you do traditional epidural, especially on patients in very advanced labor, you have to choose between fast onset of high quality analgesia or preservation of motor strength. You can't do both. I have colleagues who say to me, I don't worry about the onset of block. I just dose all my epidurals with quarter percent bupivacaine or like one or two percent lidocaine. And I think, well, OK, you're probably minimizing the differences in analgesia, but on the other hand, you're probably giving quite a dense block that isn't really consistent with ASA practice guidelines. And so the question comes up, 
who cares about motor blockade and why should you care about motor blockade? And really all of you should care about the density of block. We call it motor blockade. I'm not really sure that that's what the problem is. But with dense block, um, there's data to indicate that it interferes with rotation uh, during descent to the fetus and is more likely to prolong the second stage and most importantly result in a higher incidence of forceps and vacuum deliveries. And you should consider that, um, you know, an outcome worth avoiding if you can. This was one of the early studies. It was kind of a sentinel study in our field done by the Comet trial. It was a little bit of a messy study. They had three groups, a CSE group, a low-dose epidural group, and a traditional epidural group. You can see what their recipes were, so to speak. You can consider these first two columns together here because these were both just kind of light epidural compared to heavy epidural. The patients in the light epidural group were more likely to have a spontaneous vaginal delivery compared to the heavy epidural group. And it wasn't because of a difference in cesarean delivery, it was because they were more likely to have, I'm sorry, less likely to have forceps and vacuum deliveries. Um, so the lower concentration groups are more likely to have um, spontaneous vaginal deliveries. The CSE compared to the low dose epidural group had a faster onset of analgesia, a lower nadir pain score, and greater satisfaction. So again, you are able in the CSE group to both provide the analgesia and preserve the motor strength. This was the other paper uh, done around the same time that again compared a CSE to an epidural, but also varied the infusion. So this was kind of like a light technique and a heavy technique, and they had a lower incidence of instrumental vaginal deliveries. Uh, deliveries. Again, with lower bupivacaine consumption and greater patient satisfaction. Women don't want to be beached whales on their bed. They want to be able to move around. Um, regarding the quality of analgesia question, why does this work so much better? Well, some of it might just be because of the little hole. In these two studies, these authors made a little hole in the dura, but then didn't even put any drugs into the intrathecal space, and then threaded their catheter and dosed their catheter the same way in both groups. Um, what they were able to demonstrate was that there was better sacral coverage, no difference in the cranial extension, but better sacral coverage in the group of patients that had the little hole uh, in their dura, even without intrathecal drugs. Um, they were also able to um, demonstrate that they had a faster onset of analgesia, and again, just better sacral coverage. So it may just be that the presence of the little hole somehow, somehow helps the quality of analgesia, especially that sacral sparing that we all um, deal with all the time and provides better onset of better quality of analgesia. Um, how does the CSE technique affect need for redosing? Well, there's a little bit of con uh, controversy in the literature. This was the first study looking at it. Goodman and colleagues, again, randomized patients. They were all multiparous patients, less than five centimeters to CSE versus epidural techniques. Again, this is just showing you that they had a uh, faster onset of analgesia. I think uh, Dr. Geiser's gonna have to concede that point. She actually did not demonstrate any difference in the number of what she called top-ups or redoses, okay? Now that's in contrast to this paper by David Gambling, a randomized controlled trial of 800 patients. These patients were of mixed parity and he did demonstrate, oops, sorry, he did demonstrate both a um, difference again in analgesia, as we heard during the first stage, mostly because of the faster onset during the first hour. But he also demonstrated a difference in re, a difference in redoses. Now, what were the differences between these two studies? One was that all of the patients in the Goodman study were multiparous patients and proceeded through their labor very quickly. So maybe you just wasn't the best population to look at redosing. The second is the, um, he used a, this group used a slightly uh, more concentrated solution. So there wasn't quite as many redoses and maybe it was better for picking out the differences. 
This is one other study um, that shows that the CS, whoop, oops, sorry, that the CSE uh, technique favors like fewer redoses. So I think the bulk of the data is that if you do a CSE versus a traditional epidural technique, you're less likely to have to redose your patient, and it may just be because of that tiny little hole in the dura. All right, that's where we are. Let's talk about catheter reliability. Oh, I know what I was going to say before we go on to that. Dizer might bring up this Cochrane review that made the conclusion that there's no difference in onset or quality of analgesia, CSE versus epidural. But this is a really poor review because they took a bunch of different studies with different techniques, different patient populations, and threw them all in one pot and mixed them up. And it's not really, really a legitimate way to do a meta-analysis. So although he seems very reliable and trustworthy, <laughs> don't let him fool you. Now let's talk about ep epidural catheter reliability. Um, retrospective trials show that the CSE technique is less likely to fail and be replaced. Now, in all fairness, these are mostly done at teaching institutions. The previously mentioned um, gambling study didn't really show a difference. That was with all private practitioners who were very, um, uh, very experienced, such as um, those of you in this audience. But what do we know about catheter failures? They're mostly spurious events. There are all kinds of associated factors like obesity, et cetera, but they can predict only a small minority of failures. Um, most failures, as we were saying earlier, occur after several hours, and it has nothing to do with what happened to that patient eight or 10 hours ago when you started their uh, neuraxial analgesic. The single biggest predictor of failures is if you have to go back in the room multiple times pull that epidural out, catheter out, and do another one. But it really has nothing to do with, um, with how you start your technique. No one technique fits every patient. Sure, if you have a patient whose tracing looks like this and whose airway looks like this, and you really are worried about, oh my god, what if I end up with in the back within the next hour and her class four airway is so horrible? Maybe there might be some patients in whom you choose to forego this technique, but in most patients, the technique has advantages. So on our scorecard, this is where we are. Let's look at the ill effects on the progress of labor. Um, Lauren Sen asked the question is, combined spinal epidural analgesia associated with more rapid cervical dilatation compared to conventional epidural? And the answer to the question is just yes. Um, he was able to demonstrate that in the CSE group, the first stage of labor was 90 minutes shorter. And there's other uh, data in the literature consistent with that. These were the early epidural studies. The primary outcome variable was C-section. But what a lot of people don't realize is um, the early epidural group got CSE. The late epidural group got a straight epidural technique. And again, in both of these studies, patients who received early CSE versus later epidural analgesia had a first stage of labor that was about 90 minutes shorter, the same, uh, same length of time shown in the SEN study. So I think the progress of labor column uh, is on my side. Now, there are going to be some adverse effects. You are going to see more itching with this technique. You just are. Most of the time, the itching is mild. It's really rarely severe. It's easy to treat if you need to treat it with mu agonist antagonist. Keep in mind it's a dose response phenomenon, so don't overdose. 15 mics of fentanyl with a little bit of local anesthetic is fine. If you add the local anesthetic, even dose for dose, you'll see less pruritus. So that's what's recommended. What about headache? You don't usually see this in randomized controlled trials just because they're not powered to pick this up, but in fairness, the incidence of headache is probably about four per thousand with a 27 gauge non-cutting needle. People say, oh my God, you're crossing the blood-brain barrier. Aren't you going to get an infection? And it's true that there probably is some baseline increased rate of infection. Most iatrogenic infections are related to dural puncture, but the incidence is extremely small and most of the time the causative organism is a strep viridans which is on the uh, anesthesia provider's uh, oral or nasopharynx. So please wear a mask, okay? 
Um, also, to be consistent with this, you'd have to tell me, oh my God, puncturing the dura is such a dangerous infectious risk. I never, ever do it. I do all my C-sections under de novo epidural. And I don't think most of you would say that. And so I think this is a perfectly acceptable, safe technique. You will see rare cases of respiratory depression. Most of them are due to higher dose intrathecal opioids or with concomitant systemic opioid administration, so be careful of that. These are the recommended dose ranges, and you should think about avoiding it if somebody's had systemic opioids, especially if they're very sedated from them. Geyser might try and show you this case report that I wrote about um, an adverse response to intrathecal fentanyl, and sure, I'm going to concede, no matter what technique you use, you may occasionally see adverse reactions, but it's all about weighing risks and benefits. And I think the benefits are clearly weighing out on my side of the argument. Quickly, regarding fetal and neonatal adverse effects, this is what we're all afraid of, that you'll see a big D cell, it's thought that it might be due to the fact that you get such good analgesia, you drop your catecholamines, which are normally uterine relaxants, and you may have tachycystole. It appears, for sure, it occurs more often with neuraxial versus systemic. If you do it retrospectively, it seems to occur more often with CSC versus epidural. Don't let him fool you again. Because it turns out, if you look at this in a randomized fashion, that it probably occurs about evenly between both groups. Um, there's a little bit of, um, uh, some of these studies don't agree with each other here. It turns out, if you only look for the first 15 or 30 minutes, you're going to think that it occurs more often in the CSE group. But if you follow it, for 90 minutes, the way they did the second group, the Skupski group did, you'll see equal amounts in both groups. So you have to follow it out long enough. It's just in the CSE group, it's so fast and dramatic that everybody attributes it to the CSE. Um, the other thing to remember is there's no difference in either neonatal outcomes or in cesarean delivery rates, including emergency cesarean delivery rates, okay? Don't let the geyser show you this um, uh, Meta-analysis either, again, it's faulty because they compared CSE to any type of analgesia. And we already know that this is a function of neuraxial analgesia, not systemic. So don't let him fool you. It's not valid. I think that if you put the scorecard up, you will realize that CSE is the way to go. And now I invite my colleague. I'm going to show you what makes sense as we go along and try to figure this out. So when uh, Barbara called me up, she said, hey, Bob, do you want to challenge me? And, I, you know, never missing an opportunity to challenge, I said, absolutely. As you can see here, I'm taking the ALS uh, cold water challenge. The only reason this is funny because what happens is when you do this, you get to call somebody out. So, of course, knowing that I was challenging Barbara, I called Barbara out. And so Barbara's video shows her taking this cold glass of water pouring it. I mean, it's just done really well, pouring it. And then she sits there, takes out a check, and takes a sip of the water and says, refreshing. And so she didn't pour the water on her head. And so I showed it to my mom. You know, we're looking at both videos. She goes, I like her. She's, she's just so smart. I said, mom, I'm challenging her in a debate. She goes, oh, you better work hard. She's very smart. So my, I'm just saying, so you know, my mom is absolutely in love with you. So what we're going to do real quick is we're going to get a chance to review this. So, you know, um, the question we raise is, should a parturient receive a CSC on a routine basis? So we heard yesterday that um, uh, Charles Snyder um, sang for us once. And if you go back to the Charles Snyder meeting in which I came in 1996, I too sang. But I'm not going to sing a song this time. Instead, I'm going to share with you a little of my thoughts about the CSC. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over a quaint and curious volume of Miller lore, while I nodded nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my call room door. Tis the nurse, I muttered, tapping at my call room door, asking for labor analgesia and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December as Miss Smith, the prima gravita, arrived upon the labor floor. 
her contractions grew stronger, hesitating then no longer, to her room I was peering, as I entered, wondering and fearing, doubting and dreaming dreams no one dared to dream before. But the silence was broken and the shouting was a token, to the pain as the patient screamed the word sore, merely this and nothing more. As I opened the epidural kit with a flirt and flutter, I also grabbed a long spinal needle and began to mutter that I would place a CSE and she would be happy forevermore. I gave the CSE guessing, but no syllable expressing, and the patient experienced her burden no longer bore. Presently, my soul grew stronger, hesitating no longer, when the fetal heart rate dropped and I swore. <laughs> the patient rushed, rushed to the operating room and through the door, CSE said I, thing of badness, analgesia or madness, why drop you this fetal heart rate I implore? To this, for, to this point I fought not to swear what was my thought, CSC, nevermore. <laughs> So we're gonna get a chance to see. And what we're gonna do is, you know, I actually love this. This was, you know, I feel guilty, Barbara. You made it too easy because you gave all the data for me to show you that why I would never do a CSE on a routine basis. So let's be very clear. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about entering the intrathecal space. Your yeah, epidural needle goes in and you're gonna use a small dose of opioid and you can combine it with a small dose of local anesthetic. So I think Barbara was very clear in her approach, and you're absolutely right. When we're trying to decide between the two, you better think about the effects. It should have benefits, and it better not have increased the side effects. And that's how we're going to decide. We're going to take a look and try to figure out which has the most, most benefits without the side effects. And we, too, use the same picture with the same scale. So again, let's be very clear about the difference. With the epidural, you know, I can make my epidural fast and onset. That's using lidocaine, but that's not the goal. We want it pretty similar. We want to have the avoidance of mobility. So we're going to use a very low concentration of local anesthetic. And as Dr. Rollins presented yesterday, we might use the intermittent boluses, or we might use a PCA with boluses, but we're going to use an epidural with low concentration of local anesthetic, which is going to be compared to a CSC where we put the needle in, and we're going to give our injection needle out and thread an epidural catheter. So Barbara was very clear about that, speed of onset. And it absolutely is correct that if you look at the speed of onset, the CSE is faster than onset. So here's a data, some from two, uh, year 2000. 142 parturients were randomized to a CSE or epidural. And you can see there's no question about it. The CSE is faster in onset. So when you do it and you compare it, you have um, uh, uh, a very rapid onset of analgesia. Of course, this depends on the choice of local anesthetic. I could get a reasonable choice close to CSC using lidocaine, but remember, that's not my goal. My goal is to avoid motor blockade. So I'm going to stay with the low concentration local anesthetic, which means I am going to sacrifice onset. So as Barbara pointed out, I have to give it to you. Barbara, you're absolutely right. CSC is faster in onset. And there you go. See, Bob, I told you I was right. Well, no, Barbara, I know that. You, I, you already told me. And I conceded on this one. I gave it to you. You are right on this one. But how about patient satisfaction? Because if it's faster than onset, they must be faster. You know, this two minutes is going to make a difference in the scales. Take a look here. Here's a thousand parturients randomized to an epidural or CSE. Satisfaction with the speed of onset. Yes, they are more satisfied on a scale of one to a hundred. One to a hundred. The scale they were for a CSE was a zero, so they're very satisfied, versus a six for an epidural. I'll show you that is definitely statistically significant when you have a different, you know, a, a, a thousand patients. I argue that's probably clinically insignificant. You know, if you've got a satisfaction score of six out of a hundred, you know, where, where zero is a hundred percent satisfied, I'd say that's pretty good. So I'd say yes, statistically it's different, but clinically this isn't different. When you look at their control experience during labor, because remember, that's the sacrifice by using a lower concentration of local anesthetic, I am going to sacrifice speed of onset, but it does seem to help in terms of the fact that they're pretty satisfied with the mobility. Again, that's statistically different, but probably, I would argue, clinically significant. And then when you get an overall satisfaction score, there is no difference. So when you compare the CSE to the epidural, there is no difference in satisfaction. So the only reason the CSE is winning at this point is because it is faster in onset, which we have to give. That's the give. I have to say it absolutely is faster in onset. 
Um, but when you look at the control, there's no difference in control if you stay with the low concentration. So we are going to sacrifice some of the speed of onset by using this low concentration local anesthetic for the ultimate benefit of the patient. So here's the Cochrane review that wasn't referred to. So we'll take a look a little bit later. But the Cochrane review from 2007, um, where they looked at 2,600 patients, just looking at this CSC, there's definitely a faster onset uh, uh, with CSC that there's more paritis. Well, Barb already gave that to me, so we knew that. There's some question of lower umbilical cord pH, but it's unclear. But there was no difference in satisfaction. So in 2007, there was no difference between the two. So what they're just saying is there's a little bit faster in onset, but really no difference in satisfaction, labor, or mode of delivery. And they said their conclusion was there was little basis for offering the CSC over labor epidurals. However, that kind of was, if you notice, there was a little bit of hand waving there. You know, the heart rate drops. No, the heart rate really can drop. Factors affecting the fetal heart rate or this prolonged deceleration. We have to be very clear. We sometimes use the term fetal bradycardia, but it's not really fetal bradycardia. Fetal bradycardia is where it sustains. This is just one long deceleration where the heart rate stays down and you don't think it's going to come up, but generally by the time you're back in the operating room that it has uh, recovered. And I think Barbara very nicely pointed out the leading theory behind for this drop in heart rate is the fact that the onset of analgesia is so quick. And in fact, that is one of the risk factors. When they tried to figure out what was the risk factor for it, it depended on the speed of onset of analgesia. That the more uncomfortable they are and the more comfort they ended up resulted in these uh, uh, increased odds of developing it. So if you had this improvement, that they were in severe pain and you took them out, you put them at higher risk. But I would argue, isn't that the patient who you want the CSC for, for the one who's in severe pain? Because it's faster in onset, but they're at greater risk, at least according to this, of the development of fetal bradycardia. So now the scales are starting to be pretty even, because we saw that it is faster in onset, but the speed of onset also has a slight curse associated with it. And the fact is that it was, um, uh, uh, because of its speed of onset, seems to cause this fetal bradycardia. Well, they're going to try to tell you that this fetal bradycardia is dose dependent. It's because you give the high doses of opioids. If you use the lower doses, that you are, can avoid this prolonged fetal heart rate deceleration. Well, so here's 300 patients who got uh, randomized to either epidural with a CSC, and they used either low dose, you can see sufentanil, or high dose sufentanil. And there seems to be some question. Sorry about that. I'm standing over here. We'll see if we can get that up there. There seems to be some suggestion that there might be a dose uh, uh, response effect. Just take a look at this, the uterine hypotonus, as well as the fetal heart rate abnormalities, was higher in this group. Although 1 out of 10 still had a fetal heart rate abnormality. 1 out of 10. Remember that out of every 10 CSCs you do, 1 out of 10 is going to have a fetal prolonged deceleration. Wow, that's still, in my mind, statistically and clinically significant. And you probably do increase the odds by going the higher dose. So they do caution using lower doses with the CSC with larger amounts. Because remember, the goal is to maximize benefits to the mom uh, with minimizing effects to the baby. However, we still see it. And that's what we're talking about here, this prolonged deceleration. And it's clearly probably due to hypertonus and that's something, of fact, that it causes the uterus to contract. And there's this theory with the decreasing catecholamine tends to greater pain relief. But the clear thing is the faster the onset of analgesia, the greater the risk. Here's the yin and the yang. There's the benefit, but there's the risk. The onset does seem to increase the chance of having this prolonged deceleration. So, and the thing that's interesting about this one is it occurred with that low dose. Remember they said, don't go with doses higher than 7.5. Well, this was with a dose of 2.5. And they too saw the uh, this prolonged deceleration. So if you do enough of it, you will see these prolonged fetal heart rate decelerations. As Barbara too would say, you know, Bob, I have seen that bradycardia and I hate it too. So it happens and it's definitely a recurring theme. So let's look at this. So this was an article that was discussed yesterday. Barbara discussed it now. But we're going to look at it correctly now. So <laughs> epidurals being done in 800 parturients, or we should say neuraxial anesthesia being done in 800 patients. So we have, oops, sorry. We have patients getting the epidural, and we have 402 getting the CSC. 
So we already said faster onset of analgesia with the CSE. So we give, give me that. So they're going to talk about the better analgesia. Oh, they're much more comfortable. Because look at that. On a scale of 1 to 10, the average VSS, VAS for CSE was 1.4, where for epidural is 1.9. You know, come on. That's statistically different, but I'll argue that's clinically insignificant. And that's only for the first hour, because after that, there's absolutely no difference in the CSE. Well, they said there's less top-ups. Look at that, because five of the 400 needed in the CSE group versus 20 out of the 400. Again, I'll argue, hey, if only 20 out of 400 patients require a top-up, I'd say that's relatively clinically insignificant. 20 out of 400, so less than 5% we see here. There was a higher incidence of the fetal deceleration, higher incidence, look at that, even when they're following this long time period. Remember they said 30 minutes, 90 minutes, no different? Well, I don't know. We're seeing it here, there was definitely a higher incidence and a higher paritis in the CSE group. So if you guys remember this from yesterday, Dr. Ruffin was telling us, sorry, Barbara, I didn't mean to help Bob yesterday. So already, when she was planting the seeds, so Lisa, thank you so much for seeing it my way. So you can already see it. it wasn't just me who interpreted the data this way. Lisa yesterday kind of said, I too hate the CSE. Epidural catheters will definitely work with the CSE. That's what they argue. We heard several people talk about it this morning on the panel. You know, do the CSE and your epidural is guaranteed to work. Well, rather than this, let's look at a meta-analysis. Meta-analysis is seven studies looking at 1,400 patients. So a decent end. Relative re re risk for top-ups, so no difference. Relative risk for epidural catheter replacement after the CSE versus the epidural, no difference. So there was, you can see, it seems to be different by the fact, though, that if the confidence interval includes one, that seems to suggest that there is no difference. And I think that's the problem with this, that when we looked at the fact that with skilled providers, when you take a look at residents, there's absolutely no question about it. My resident can find a loss resistance in the uh, uh, supraspinous ligament. You know, they push hard enough. And I promise you, they can thread a catheter five centimeters into the supraspinous ligament. You know, you can do anything with enough force. And then they're like, I can't believe it didn't work. And I'm like, you can't believe it. You spent a half hour trying to push it in because you thought you had loss. Take a second back. If it doesn't make sense, it probably isn't in. So sit there. It should be a clear loss, and the catheter should thread easy. And if you take that step back, you're going to see that there's absolutely no difference between the two. So we're not seeing any difference with that. So with that, CSC is not associated with the reduced risk for epidural placement. How about this conversion? I think the key to this is taking a look at this, is that um, the number of boluses, um, uh, the urgency, and whether you're being cared for by an obstetric anesthesia provider. So all those factors will have a factor on whether your epidural will work. You know, knowing how quickly they're going to go, what local anesthetic to choose, and when to pull an epidural catheter probably has a bigger risk factor than rather than it's a CSC versus an epidural. Well, a lot of people say that it's less work. You know, you don't have to go back and bolus the people. Well, already, Barbara proved it for us. She showed this, 100 patients, randomized to CSE for epidural. No difference in top-ups. It's been consistent things. So you do the CSE, you violated the door, and you're getting no difference. You're going to have to bolus as frequently as if you didn't do it. Um, and there was no difference in VAS at 10 and 30 minutes. Uh, uh, it was at 10 minutes, but no difference after 30 minutes. But we already knew that. It is faster onset. So they said there was no difference in the need for top-up doses in the previous patients. And then finally, here's taking a look at where they said that there's a faster labor. Remember, that's not been consistent, where people say they have this rapid cervical dilatation. 788 in the Gliparis Parturian study, randomized to CSC versus epidural. Take a look. No difference in time to complete dilation. Wait a minute. I thought you told me there's a rapid onset. And these 800 patients, they didn't see a difference in complete dilation. No difference in time from analgesia to delivery. No difference in need for oxytocin. No difference in maternal satisfaction. So the only way to summarize this is there's no difference. And again, we conclude here, no significant difference between epidural and CSE in oliparous women for duration of labor or mode of delivery. Well, you're going to hear the next speaker is going to talk about maternal temperature and the fact of epidurals. And so maybe that's it. I'm surprised Barbara didn't touch on that because let's face it, we do know that epidurals are associated with maternal fever. Dr. Siegel is going to give us this wonderful talk on it. 
However, is it in associated with the CSC? Uh, the answer is yeah. It turns out that there's no difference between the two. So there's something about putting the needle in the back, not just the catheter, but the needle. Association between the two. So you can see between epidural, 71 randomized CSE or IV medications, definitely increase in temperature. And you can see five patients in that CSE group. So it's not universal. I'm going to stop there because I'm not the expert. Dr. Siegel's the expert in this, and he's going to give us the better talk on that. But do realize you do see an increase in temperature, but you do see it with epidural. So I would say this is a wash. So you got to like it. Don't you love it when somebody sits there, you read a study that doesn't agree with what you say. You say, well, it's like this. They put it in a pot and they mix it up and they, it just came. Wait, so just because you don't like it doesn't mean that it wasn't done properly. So the people who reviewed this came out and published this. Is that who we should believe? Or should we believe somebody who sits and says, well, it's going against what I was supposed to debate Bob on. And you know, it gives me a chance to show a very handsome picture of him, even more handsome than that Prince Charming picture. But, you know, is that what's going on here? So take a look here. CSC versus epidural. You decide. 27 trials. CSC, faster onset. Well, they're honest, right? They're sitting there. But lower uh, need for rescue analgesia, more paritis, and then this umbilical cord view. So I was hoping you all would join me. All join me in reading this out loud. Because we do want to make sure that Barbara can hear it. So let's do this right now. Let's do it. And please read it with the loudest voice you can. There appears, come on, join me. There appears to be little basis for offering CSC over epidurals in labor with no difference in satisfaction. Now, I know you guys didn't put that, uh, that no, but you know, next time you read that out loud, make sure you put that emphasis on no, okay? Because that's the importance behind it. With no difference in satisfaction. And then here's another Cochrane review in 2011 that we do know that epidurals work. And epidurals have no, uh, are effective, no increased risk on C-section, no increased risk of backing. So wait a minute. So here's this Cochrane review saying that we have a technique that's very safe, right, with no increased risk. And you want to offer this technique just because it's a little faster in onset that doesn't seem to affect this uh, uh, satisfaction. You got to decide on that. Here's taking a look at CSE versus epidural on labor. And again, we saw no difference in delivery. So the importance behind this is that there's no difference in labor uh, 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 delivery. Uh, and we took a look. We tried to say that it's possibly a faster labor. Yes, they saw a seven-minute difference. So is seven minutes important? I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, but with the CSE, higher paritis, higher lightheadedness, and higher nausea. So I think I'm getting close. But let's take a look at some other things that was kind of talked about. So about, what about that combined spinal epidural? So let's take a look at this. And it's wonderful if you guys were here yesterday. It's just outstanding when the people that lectured before you just do your talk for you. So here's taking a look at CSE. Seven cases of permanent injury with the, oh, wait, let's add that up. Seven cases of permanent CSE. Because all of them thought they were injecting an L23, but in reality, they were injecting higher than they thought. And you got to realize, Dr. Siegel told us that yesterday, right? He said we're not very good at identifying the site. And in fact, if you remember what Dr. Siegel said, he says we're always going higher than we thought. So do you really want to be putting a needle through the dura in an area that's higher than you thought, right where the spinal cord is underneath? This data would seem to suggest not. So Dr. Siegel, I thank you. And you did tell us that yesterday. Now. Barbara, if I knew you were going to help Bob, I wouldn't have invited you to the meeting. So, but I'm glad she did invite you because you really helped prove my point yesterday. You too were arguing in favor of the epidural versus the CSE. Because remember, he showed us this, that we're not very good at identifying Tufier's line. And I don't pronounce it as well as uh, Dr. Siegel, but you can see here, this is what we think of. When we're going to look at this, we assume that the spinous process, when we touch the top of the iliac crest, should be touching the L4 spinous process. But in reality, when they did the ultrasound on these 45 women in the sitting position, the majority of them were at L2-3. So if we touch here and say, all right, well, I think I'll go right here. If you do an epidural, you know, obviously you don't want to get a dural puncture. But if you do a CSC, you're putting that patient at risk of trauma to the spinal cord because we're not very good at identifying the level. We're putting this patient at increased risk of neuro injury because we're going higher than we thought. 
Here's another point to ponder. So these were just taken right from the literature. Go to uh, uh, this uh, MMWR. A healthy 24-year-old parturient admitted to a New York hospital on September 8th. She received a CSC, and a healthy 31-year-old admitted to the same hospital. Both received the CSC. Both developed meningitis. How about this? Again, published in 2010. Healthy 26-year-old parturient admitted to a hospital in Ohio. She received spinal, and another healthy one got the same night. Both had meningitis, and one died. So I think the key to this is we see this that the risk is low, but what are we supposed to tell that one woman who died from meningitis? Well, you know, I know it happened, but you were very low risk. You know, it happens, and we have to be very careful. And I think we're talking about this, and now I'm gonna just pause, because I could keep on arguing. And what we're not arguing is the same thing. We're not arguing, I still do the CSC. What we're saying is, when you do the CSC, you better be careful. Take a second and make sure you use a septic technique Take a second and make sure the level. That's all these two slides are. Now I'll go back to the debate where I'm going to try to convince you against CSE. There are isolated cases. So that's what they said. Remember, if I'm not mistaken, those were the exact words that uh, Dr. Gavon said. These are just isolated cases. Really? What about the Southern, uh, Southern Medical Journal? Iatrogenic meningitis and obstetric patient after CSE. How about this one? Bacterial meningitis following CSE analgesia for labor. How about bacterial meningitis following CSE for labor? How about meningitis following a CSE technique in a labor term parture? How about meningitis after CSE? They're out there. The fact is nobody's going to publish these cases anymore because no new knowledge on this. The risk is real. We have to be very careful. And that's what Barbara was also trying to argue. We're both agreeing on this one. While I'm arguing against the CSE, we're both agreeing. Take the time and use the most aseptic technique you can. That's what we're asking for on this one. Take the time and identify the level. It's not the time to guess a little bit higher if you're going to decide the CSE because you put the risk patient at risk of trauma. So meningitis almost exclusively occurs following the perforation of the dura. So what about the CSE versus the epidural? When we look at speed of onset, there's absolutely no question. CSE wins. I'll have to give it to Barbara on that one. How about paritis? Well, yeah, epidural is better in that regard. There's definitely a higher risk. So remember, it's slow, it's trivial. Hey, it's a real phenomenon and it occurs, and it can be quite annoying to the patient. So we have to give that to the epidural. Nausea, lightheadedness, epidural. CSC, remember, there's a little bit of hand waving. Yeah, there's a couple of cases, there's always a risk, but you uh, wait a minute. You just told me there's a higher instance of lightheadedness. Let's be very clear that, uh, who cares? All that was was to say it's definitely a risk with CSC, but not with epidural. Patient satisfaction, I'll give it a draw. You know, both are the same. So patients are satisfied no matter what they get, as long as they get comfortable in that. Epidural boluses, I call it a draw. That we see that they're both having uh, uh, to require boluses. I'd say that if you wanted to argue, yes, it was statistically different. I'll argue it was clinically insignificant. But when we looked at that, there was one study which showed a statistically significant difference. How about the epidural catheter? That's a clear draw. Doing a CSE, but what we're talking about is not going out of your realm. So yes, if you force, you know, if you need the CSE needle to confirm every time you're in the epidural space, you got to think about your technique, right? Come on, if you need the CSE to tell you when you're in, where you can't take the fact that, well, you know, I can't thread the catheter, and yeah, it was a questionable loss of resistance. Maybe I should just take it out and refine it. Absolutely, um, it's what. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Main was talking about today. You know, we've got to realize denial's not just a river in Egypt. Denial exists every day. <laughs> Sit there and acknowledge it's not working and just redo that epidural. How about effect on labor? I'd say it's a draw, and there's absolutely no question about it. The risk is small. The risk is very small, but it's definitely higher with the CSC. So with that one, the epidural wins, and with meningitis, there's no question about it. Dr. Scavone is absolutely correct. It is definitely low, but it's definitely in favor of epidural. With uh, CSC, you put the patient at risk, and you've got to use very strict aseptic technique. So I don't know about you, but when I do the math, I come up with four to one, so I would say epidural wins. So there I am at the end of the Disney Marathon, uh, and this is, I guess, probably about mile 16, and I'm still going good. I got a chance to pose with Jiminy Crickton, who sits there and says, you know, Bob, don't you ever tell a lie because your nose will grow, you know, like Pinocchio. And you can see here, I've given my whole talk, and you can see right now, my nose is the exact same length as when I started. So it really is no lie. Don't worry, Jiminy, it's not a lie. 
not all women require a CSE. With that, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you.